So anyway, so my name is Josh Miller. Uh, I am a professional photographer. I, sh I live in Nevada City, um, so Northern California. Um, I just got back from Alaska on, what would that be, a week ago yesterday. So um, I was just up there teaching a bald eagle workshop. I was up in the summer in Alaska and, and then in Costa Rica as well. So um, I do workshops. I work with uh, different magazines. I still do outdoor photographer articles, things like that. Um, so I'm kind of in a lot of different worlds. Uh, I used to be uh, primarily doing landscape stuff um, and then landscape and adventure photography, you know, climbing, skiing, backpacking, those types of things. Um, and over time, I've moved, I would say it used to be probably 75% landscape. Then it grew to maybe 50% landscape and more of the adventure stuff. And as the photo stock agency stock market kind of fell apart, um, I started also doing more wildlife stuff, which is super fun. Um, and, you know, teaching more classes and doing things like this. Okay, sweet. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so uh, I used to do, and I still do some, but I, I, you know, was doing a lot of stuff for the Sierra Club with landscape stuff, Autobahn, Nat Geo, all of those types of things. And I've just been, you know, to some extent as a business person, having to adapt as, you know, people, uh, there's, there's less of a market for landscape images. They're still my favorite. There's no question. Um, stuff like this, this is Yosemite. This is the, uh, you know, maybe some of you guys uh, know about the, the horse tail falls, the fire falls in Yosemite um, that happens in February. So having shot that and it, uh, years and years ago, 10, 15 years ago, um, it's a total zoo in the valley now. And so I was you know, looking for, and this is what I enjoy about landscape photography is trying to find a different angle on something, trying to find a unique photo. So with this, this is looking down at El Capitan. You can't see my mouse, unfortunately. That's one of the downfalls of the Zoom thing. But across the valley is, uh, um, that's El Capitan. And then this is looking over the, the rim down to El Capitan and down into the valley. And, and what's one of the things I really like about this photo, and this is old to go back to our conversation of how much image quality do you need. This is like a 10 megapixel file or something like that. Um, and I've blown it up pretty darn big. And uh, with this, it's a 10 mile ski to get there because it's off of Glacier Point Road, but the road's closed in the winter. So I really like to find photos that are uh, harder to reach, more you know, more unique, things like that. That's, that's the thing I really enjoy about landscape photography. Um, it's fun to shoot, you know, uh, uh, from you know tunnel view in Yosemite or something, but it's it's even more rewarding to try to find something new. Um, that's kind of my my take on it. So so I think one of the big things with with landscape photography or any type of photography is really choosing a subject that inspires you. Um, so this is Lake Tahoe uh, um, and uh, uh, Sand Harbor actually, and uh, one of the things for me. Like I got into photography the summer I worked in Alaska at a hotel. Um, it was nothing glamorous. I was like at the front desk of the hotel, but it gave me a chance to go and uh, live and work at Denali National Park for a summer. And I bought just a camera at a pawn shop, came back, uh, back to school or back to college. And a friend uh, said, you know, I was washing dishes and this friend was like, oh, you, you, have, you have a camera? Like she worked for the school newspaper. Oh, hey, we'll give you, I think it was 50 bucks, um, which, you know, at the time was a lot of money to go shoot this thing. We'll pay for the film and develop it and everything. And I thought, this is amazing. You know, so I started doing that and I've got really into doing the journalism thing. And, uh, you know, pretty quickly it was like, it's way more fun to shoot photos and get paid to do that than it is to wash dishes. And uh, um, through doing that, I thought for a long time, I would do the work at a newspaper, you know, small paper, daily, big paper you know, we all aspire to go work at Time or National Geographic or whatever. Um, but what I realized was when I graduated college, I spent a couple of years um, living in a minivan, actually worked in, you talked about Thousand Oaks, which is where you guys are all at, or mostly. Uh, a friend of mine found uh, a job down in Ventura, a guiding job, taking students on outdoor adventure trips and stuff like that, and uh, outdoor ed. And uh, so they lived in Thousand Oaks. She was actually teaching at a school in Thousand Oaks. And that's how she found out about 
So I went down there and I didn't shoot any photos for a couple of years. And I realized that I'd gotten burned out on shooting things that I wasn't all that interested in. High school graduations, you know, football games. It's super fun to shoot football or basketball from the sidelines. But once you kind of learn how to do it, unless you're interested in football, which I'm not, um, it just got really boring. So there was this period of time where I really was didn't really shoot. And I wasn't sure I was even going to be interested in photography until I started turning it around and really photographing things that I was excited about. Um, and I think that applies to whatever it is that you are interested in shooting, whether it's birds, landscapes, you know, wildlife, uh, adventure stuff, uh, portraits, people, you know, black and white, whatever it is. I think the key is you got to really be excited about your, your subject matter. Um, so, so for me, it was connecting the, the landscapes and I love, I'm a big outdoor adventure person. So I love backpacking and skiing and hiking, and, you know, so to get to go out to a beautiful place and then have to hang out, this is the beauty of being a photographer, right? Whether it's landscape or wildlife, you go to an amazing spot and then you just have to spend time there. Everybody else goes and visits this spot at, at uh, Lake Tahoe in this photo. You know, they maybe they go for the sunset, but they're there. And as soon as the sun sets, they're gone. You know, I'll go to this spot, especially when I take like a group of photographers. We'll be there for like three hours, and you just get to watch the light change and watch the you know, you know, thing loons come swimming by that you don't expect. Um, so really, having that time, being forced to spend time in beautiful places, it's it's a pretty cool thing. You know, we we are lucky people, us photographers, all of us. So. So composition, you know, some tips, you know, some of this, like I said, is maybe, you know, new and some of this is probably like, oh yeah, I've heard this before. Um, but the first thing, one of the basic rules of, of all photography is this idea of the rule of thirds, which is if we divide the frame, I just realized I don't have the, the shot with the lines in it. Hopefully most of you guys have heard this, but if, if, if we divide the frame in thirds vertically and horizontally, um, it's trying to put your subject in maybe more of one of the, where the lines would meet in one of the corners. And I'll show you kind of some demos here as we go through. Um, and then another piece, I think with landscape photography, and this is what I love about continuing to use a tripod, um, which we'll talk about tripods in a little bit. But um, one of the things I really like about landscape photography is that it's generally slow. You know, life is especially life was uh, as a parent, an eight-year-old and an 11-year-old, life's pretty fast and busy. And, you know, you go to this spot or, or the previous one or the next one, and you spend all this time and you slowly move the camera a little higher, a little lower to the right, to the left. You're refining that composition. You're working this scene until you find like the absolute perfect spot. If there is one. And sometimes, sometimes I don't think there is one, um, you know, and then you're kind of making the best of, the best of the options it's good it won't there we go i was gonna say it won't switch slides <laughs> um so here's an example of that this is another old old shot but uh this is hanging in my office until we moved out of our house and rented it um you know not the most exciting composition there's not some amazing clouds or something but you know a really nice pre-dawn glow with the moon um this is in the eastern sierras and the next shot is the same exact spot and it's you know, there's more than one image. There's more than one composition. So really working a scene. You know, I I, th I personally, um, as we're talking about composition, I personally like verticals more than I like horizontals or landscape format um, because I like the ability to create more depth to it. You know, we've got a close foreground, a midground with this reflection, the trees, the mountains and then even the moon um you know and and this is going back to like the days of like a graduated uh you know graduated filter um which we'll talk about as well so really you know working the scene and seeing hey there's more than one composition here what if i'm moving what if i'm shooting vertical horizontal things like that um another one of the things that i think often doesn't get talked about because we spent a lot of time as photographers talking about, we did this right when we started talking about cameras and gear and da 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 da, but talking about the types of light. Um, and so as we go through this, take a look and think about, and anytime, I mean, I, I definitely, even when it's a portrait, 
when I see a good photo, I always try to take it apart in my mind. Like, how, how did they create that? What kind of light did they use? Was it artificial light? You know, I see uh, someone has the, uh, Dennis has the, is that the Bixby bridge or a, a cool bridge in the fog? You know, that the light, as well as the composition is what makes that photo really nice. You know, and that's, that's kind of the trick to it. So for uh, subjects that are close to the camera, generally, and these are not hard and fast rules. Um, I think it's important that everything I say, you could totally blow it off. <laughs> it's just like, uh, you know, they're, they're general generalizations. There's, there's lots of times where this does not apply. Um, but in general, for closer subjects, um, I just did some senior portraits for my nephew actually the other day. And, you know, they were like, oh, it's beautiful, sunny. And I'm like, no, no, we want shade. For close subjects, for intimate detail, we want shade usually. Um, versus at subjects that are distant, often we want the harsh sun because it's going to add contrast. So when it's close, we don't want a lot of contrast. If we go back to this image, if the sun were hitting and there are sharp, harsh shadows in that foreground, all of a sudden the foreground really wouldn't work. It would be even better if the mountains actually had some crazy alpine glow on them, which they didn't that day. Um, you know, so the best world is when you get a little bit of both. You know, the distance is brighter or more contrasty. Um, so here's a couple examples. Uh, this is the Eastern Sierras. And, uh, you know, we waited for a couple of hours uh, for this whole grove of aspen to go into the shade because, you know, we didn't want one side of the tree to be, you know, black and the other side to be white or to the shadows cast from one tree onto another or something like that. So I think another thing is, as we were kind of chatting at the beginning here, is like the karma of like shooting when you have family with you or traveling with non-photographers. Um, you know, it's like building up that karma and knowing when to, when it's worth like sticking around and taking the time and when it's like, okay, yeah, the light's not gonna work for this and I can't stay here for three hours. So, you know, having the time. So we just were in Bryce Canyon. We just did a big road trip this fall and uh, we were in Bryce Canyon and, and it was the first snowstorm of the, of the year. We got there the night before, got a campsite. When I went out at, you know, really, really early, <laughs> really, really cold. And unfortunately there weren't any, there was just a tiny little bit of clouds. There wasn't really much there for clouds. So the sunrise ended up really not being all that great. But because we had a bunch of time, um, we stayed for another night, we stayed a couple of days there. Um, that night of that snowstorm, um, it got way more stormy looking and dramatic clouds and these like pockets of light were coming down and lighting up different things. Um, so this is kind of that example. We've got the close foreground being in the shade, but as it goes farther back, we have more dramatic, more high contrast light. Um, so it kind of leads you into that distant background. Um, and this was the, with the Olympus, by the way, handheld. Handheld HDR with the Olympus. A whole new world. This is another example of that as well. Um, this is in the Sierras um, and uh, with the moon there in the corner and everything. And with this, again, having the stuff up close in the shade, you know, once the sun came down into here onto that snow and ice, um, you know, it just, it did not look good at all. But at the same time, we wanted that alpine glow up on the distant peaks. And then, yeah, with this, this is a bracketed three exposure image because, you know, the mountains in the water in that reflection are going to be way too bright in comparison to the, to the ice and the snow around them. And so I had to kind of like blend the two. That way I had a proper exposure in the foreground for both the highlights of the mountains and the uh, the ice at the same time. So, so Josh? Have, yeah, I was going to say, does anyone have any questions on this? I have one? a question on this one. You say you bracketed it. So did you yeah. merge it in a, an HDR type of approach or in layers within Photoshop? Uh, so I, I'm like 99% Lightroom. Um, Photoshop is great. It's better, you know, but it's just like less intuitive and slower and so on and so forth. So I'm pretty much consistently now in a scene like this, I'm bracketing either two or three stops. So if you don't know what this means, so the light meter is going to, you know, you kind of get your, your best single exposure, but with this, you know, the mountains versus the shade in the foreground are too wide of an exposure for a single image. So I'm shooting two or three stops 
overexposed and two or three stops underexposed plus the middle. It's not always zero on the meter, so, but you know we can kind of go, go there in a little bit if we want. Um, and then I'm taking all three of those images in Lightroom. So I'm not moving the camera. It's on a tripod. Nothing's changing. And it's doing it really quick. That way, you know, the clouds haven't moved or anything else. And then in Lightroom, you just select all three and it puts them together into a single image. And the basic, and you could do this in Photoshop. There's other programs, but the same basic principle. Now, all of a sudden you have more information in the highlights, more information in the shadows. That way you can, you know, tone down the highlights, bring up the shadows, bring it back to closer to what you can see with your eye, not what the camera sees. So that's kind of the, the basic process. So you are treating it as HDR then? So yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I have a slide actually about the graduated filters in here, but I would say a large majority of the landscape stuff now that I shoot, if it's high contrast, it's almost all done that way. Um, it's just gotten so good and it's so natural that... Uh, you know, I mean, it, for a while when HDR first came out, it was all this like really crazy garish, like, you know, there's like too much detail and there was no blacks and there are no real whites and um, it just looked weird. But, um, you know, and, I, and I've always been a, you know, I'm using the cameras as a tool, trying to get it as close to reality as I can. And that's the whole, you know, reality is different with how I see it versus how someone else sees it is, is going to be different. It's going to depend on the mood you're in. You know, that's the art part. And so, you know, there's a certain interpretation to everything. Um, and that's actually, I think, one of my favorite parts of it. So I've got some stuff on exposure. We, should we do this? Should we just kind of blast forward? I don't know where everybody's at on like levels of things. Can I ask yeah. one question going back? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so, I understand HDR to be more changing the focal length, not the exposure. Am I misguided on that? Yeah, I think you're thinking about like stacking focus. Or yeah, focus stacking. Focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. totally different. Okay. They can be done together, but totally so like with this, it's you know, exposure, this it's bracketing exposure only. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And I'm not a big user, I'm not against it, of that focus stacking thing, because in general, I feel like I have enough depth of field in my landscapes. This will come to come up in a slide in a little bit, but uh, I generally feel like I have enough depth of field most of the time with the lenses that I have, if used properly, that it's not really an issue. I'm not really worried about it, even though, yeah, it is sharper and theoretically better. I don't find that it's really holding me back either by not doing focus stacking. I'm lazy or efficient, depending on who you ask. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's like I, I have so many photos from so many different things. I hardly have time to, to edit them. So I want to have to do as little on the computer as, as possible. Yeah. You know? yeah. So should I just blast through this exposure thing really quick or do a lot of people want a deeper dive into Why don't you just go through it relatively quickly? Yeah, yeah. So the big thing with exposure, and this kind of comes from that talking about HDR and things like that, is your camera doesn't see, it's getting better and better, each generation of cameras, but your camera does not see as much of a range between, between black and white. Um, the human eye and the human brain is, is amazing, um, you know, just in terms of like the optics of it and how your brain processes it. It's, it's pretty amazing. We can't build a camera that's better at this point. Um, so a proper exposure is, is trying to take as best we can the, the information that's in a scene in a single image, theoretically. If we go back to this, there's too much information. You can see it with your eye, but the camera is either gonna have the mountains and are gonna be blown out, meaning they're gonna be overexposed. There's not going to be detail in the highlights, especially in the snow, or the shadows are going to be too dark, but you can only have one or the other unless you blend them together. Um, so exposure is getting the correct amount of light to reach the film or the sensor. Um, sensors now pretty much, unless someone's shooting film. Um, uh, so it's really, the key with that is figuring out how much light and then determining how long you either leave the shutter open or how big the opening, how big the aperture in the lens is. And it's like a teeter-totter, you know, more shutter speed, 
you know, that's going to affect your aperture, vice versa. But either way, you got to get the two to balance. There we go. You got to get the two to balance, right? So you want it to be not too bright, not too dark. And then the histogram is that graph. And this is something I find, you know, I'll take people to Alaska to photograph bears or Costa Rica to see wildlife or Yosemite for landscapes or whatever. And they, they've spent all this money and they have this amazing camera and a $10,000, $12,000 lens on and they don't understand the histogram. So I think this is one of the things that really is super valuable, no matter what you shoot. Um, and that is this graph. And on the left, the far end, you can, yeah, you can't see my map. Uh, on the far left is pure black. And on the far right is pure white. And the human eye, it would be the equivalent of, if you looked at this graph, the human eye can see beyond the edges of this graph. But this graph is what the camera can see. And each camera with progression of better and better cameras, that graph is getting wider and wider and wider and getting closer to what your eye can see. Um, so a proper exposure in general is gonna keep everything within that range. You know, and, there, and there are times when it won't all fit within that range. So we can look at this, this histogram is what we call it. This is a screenshot from Lightroom. It's the exact same graph that's gonna show up in you know, different ways in Photoshop. It's gonna show up in, any other editing program, Adobe Bridge, um, and it's also the same one on the back of the camera. So it's important to understand that, that what you're seeing in all those places, don't trust the picture on the back of the camera because it's a processed JPEG version of your raw file if you're shooting raw. So trust the graph. Um, so we look at this, we can tell the different tones going on in this photo. We have this big peak here um, under the M and the A, since I can't use the mouse. Um, that's a big bright peak. That's representing the tones in the sky, right? Maybe realistically, this should have been exposed just a little brighter, push that graph a little more to the right, which should have made a little more room on the left, right under the eye or above the eye of ISO um, is we're losing some details, some black. And that's probably the shadow behind the Land Rover or the Land Cruiser, I should say. Um, my buddy would be very angry if, if, I, if he heard me use the wrong term. Um, this is in Costa Rica, so my friend's like baby is his Jeep or uh, Land Cruiser. Um, anyways, uh, so I did this on purpose. I purposely changed the exposure of this while not changing the camera settings, meaning it's one file that I moved around. That way we could illustrate that, you know, when you move the slider in Lightroom or whatever program you're using, you can change the histogram. You're not actually changing what the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO was. So um, the one on the left, when it's underexposed, that graph is pushed off to the right. The one on the right, the overexposed one, you can see that peak from the previous frame pushed all the way to the right. You can see the end result. We lose the detail in the sky. The sky starts falling apart. Um, whereas we're losing detail in the, you know, in the shadows on the left. Sorry, I forgot to tell everyone I got uh, yellow fever and typhoid shots today for our trip. <laughs> so like, I'm thirsty, my arms sore, I'm a little <laughs> tired. I'm oh. getting a, a polio shot on Friday and the COVID booster tomorrow. So I'm going to be all wiped out wow. um, before leaving. So, uh, all right. So shutter speed, this, you know, we talk about this in different ways, but I wanted to give some examples. Uh, for landscape photography, we tend to do a lot of slow shutter speeds, a lot of using a tripod, uh, you know, wanting to blur water, using a tripod because you want more depth of field, things like that. Faster scenes, you know, you're talking action, you don't need a tripod or it's really bright out. Um, I mean, I, I was definitely steeped in the, because you know, I shot slide film for Sierra Club and things like that. I was definitely steeped in, you just don't shoot a landscape photo without a tripod. It just never happened. And it's definitely changing, like playing with that Olympus this, this summer and or this fall. You know, I, I've been shooting things that are handheld that I'm bracketing for HDR and, and it works. And, you know, I'm using the tripod a lot less. I'm not carrying a seven pound tripod anymore. I'm carrying a little, you know, small thing, which just makes it a lot more fun. So stuff like this. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but this would be probably about a second and a half somewhere in that range. Um, this is in Glacier National Park. And then there, there was this like sun coming in. 
um, you know, kind of light backlighting the, the mist off this falls. So again, it's shot off the bridge actually where people were walking on um, like a footbridge, um, but a slow shutter speed um, is allowing me. So it's less about the aperture. Um, we'll talk about the apertures in a second. It's more about getting that slow shutter speed. So setting your aperture in a way, you know, I was probably shooting at like F11 just to, or even S16 in order to slow down, to let less light through the lens so I could get a slower shutter speed. Just shot this the other day. Um, this is uh, in Zion National Park. Um, this is uh, hiking into the subway um, and same thing. So with this, you know, I was shooting wide and uh, I went super early in the morning. I hiked in in the dark um, because I, I knew it was gonna get windy in the afternoon and I knew the fall colors would be good. And so with this, I'm shooting with, uh, what is it? It's a 14 to 24 uh, lens. I think I'm probably about 24 or something like that. Um, and then I have a polarizer on there to take some of the reflection out um, to make the colors pop. And then I'm just doing as long a shutter speeds as I can get um, with the filters that I had with me to uh, darken things. So I think this was like a three or four seconds or something like that. Are there any questions on the slow shutter speed stuff? So this is this is one of my favorite uh, landscapes. We were talking about the Yosemite stuff and you know, trying to find new angles and things like that. Um, this is, I definitely got some help from a friend on this who's like really into uh, um, astrophotography. Um, but we hiked up uh, above Yosemite Falls um, in the afternoon or midday, waded through several miles of snow to get up into this spot and then got up in the middle of the night so we got a slow shutter speed to you know have yosemite falls on the left like blurring um, but then um, not too slow of a shutter speed that the stars are still pinpoints and so with this we actually this is this is like the most complicated photo i've ever taken um and it was definitely my buddy was like giving me advice on this um so it's actually two exposures a couple of hours apart so set the tripod up on this cliff edge, shot the foreground while there was a little sliver of moon and then waited for the moon to go away and the Milky Way to come up and then shot the Milky Way and then put the two together. Um, and and I, I mean, I love the photo and I've sold several prints and spent some calendars and things. I still am a little on the fence with my ethics on this photo because it's not at all what you can see with the naked eye, right? You can't see the Milky Way like you do in a photo with the naked eye. That's one of the places cameras can be the, the human eye, um, you know, and it is, it's all one night. It's all the same place. It's all that. But at the same time, it's also like a span of a period of a couple of hours between the two exposures. So um, it's an interesting, you know, it's still reality, but it's, you know, so I, I always, when I have more time with these, like I always love to have a conversation about this and kind of get people's take on it because um, it's a unique view and, you know, there's half dome in the background, and, you know, um, so it's one of my favorites, but it is also like not a single frame like this. Um, so this is some fast shutter speed stuff, not necessarily landscape, but I've stuck in a little bit of wildlife just to talk about, um, you know, uh, composition and things like that. But fast shutter speeds, you're freezing eagles, you're freezing bears fighting. This is uh, on one of my bear trips in Katmai National Park in Alaska. Um, you're freezing hummingbirds, it's a Costa Rica trip, um, things like that. Uh, and we can talk about with these, you know, is it a landscape? Well, it's not a landscape like a grand landscape, but it's also, I'm building a composition, trying to figure out where, you know, how to fit the background, how to like get a clean background, things like that. Um, this I just took like, last week with the Olympus. Um, and uh, with this, this is, it's a single frame. And, you know, we've got the landscape, which could be shot at a slow shutter speed, right, the mountain. But then we also have the eagle soaring flying through. Um, and so with this, uh, we set up, like we'd had a couple of really good shooting days. And, and this is great wildlife and landscape advice. Um, we basically conceptualized this photo, myself and the, and the people I had with me on the trip. Um, we thought, man, that, that mountain looks awesome right now. It's a great landscape. And, you know, we shot it with no birds in it. We're like, okay, cool. I was like, man, it would be really amazing if an eagle would fly through, you know, kind of down in that bottom right-hand corner. And 
you know, it was kind of midday. The eagles weren't feeding too much on the salmon near where we were. So we sat on the river bar for like three or four hours. And every time an eagle flew across, we just tracked it and just shot as it went across. And, you know, about three hours into it, man, if we didn't get the eagle flying right in front of our perfect background. Um, so from a compositional standpoint, you know, we were visualizing um, the background, visualizing what could be, and then waiting for it to happen. Um, you know, so it's a landscape and a, and a wildlife. So this is one I find, understanding depth of field, I find that, and this kind of goes back to the question that was asked a minute ago, that people don't understand as much as they think they do about this or, or understand bits and pieces of it. So I think it's important to, to first to, to recognize there's a difference between sharpness and focus. Meaning the sharpness of a lens is not necessarily whether it's in focus or not, or vice versa. You can have an in-focus photo that's really not all that sharp. So there's there's some different aspects. But, you know, as us photographers, we pay obscene amounts of money for that new lens that's supposedly sharper, right? And then we're like, I don't see a difference. Um, well, the sharpness of the lens is really how crisp it's going to render things. But if you're not focusing in the right place, you're not dealing with the depth of field that you've chosen based on your aperture in the right way, you're not really taking advantage of that. So, so lenses are at their sharpest in the middle of their aperture range. So if it's a, let's say it's a, an F4 lens, you know, it's like a, we'll, we'll, we'll do this. Uh, say it's like a 24 to 70, 2.8. Well, it's, it's decently sharp. They're good, especially in the new ones, you know, the stuff being made for the mirrorless stuff. Um, you know, it's sharp at 2.8, but if you stop that thing down to F4, 5.6, F8, probably 5.6 and F8 are going to be, you know, you'll be able to tell the difference between 2.8 and F8 um, in terms of the crispness, the sharpness, which is independent of the depth of field. More will be in focus at F8 also. Um, so understanding that difference because there are times when it doesn't matter what aperture you're at. You have plenty of depth of field at 2.8, at f11, at f8, at 1.4. It's all going to be the same, but yet your lens will be sharper if you shoot it at f8. Um, so understanding the difference of that. So it's really all about where do you want to focus? So uh, at any given depth, uh, depth of field or any given aperture, um, you're going to get from the point that you focus on, you're going to get about one third of the depth of field in front of that point and two thirds behind that point. This is sometimes when we talk about hyperfocal distance. And I've always thought that that gets really complicated really quickly. But what you need to know is you're going to have, <laughs> if, you're going to have more in focus behind where you, the point you focus on and less in focus in front. And then depending on what aperture number you use, that range between the front and the back is either smaller or larger. Um, and that's like when you can wrap your brain around that. And I try not to use the word hyper, hyper focal distance, some of that stuff, because I think it just overly complicates it. You could get a tape measure out and you could be like, oh, with my full frame camera at an F8 at 16 millimeters, I get X amount. And then you could go measure it out. And, you know, but who does that? Right. And especially now we can look on the back of the camera and see, did we get it or not? <laughs> Zoom in. Right. So, Take a look at this, and this is uh, an example of something that, uh, you know, and I like to talk about in focus or sharpness or perceived focus versus in focus. If you look at these, almost every landscape photo that we have all ever looked at, if it's like beautiful flowers in the foreground or a lake in the foreground and then mountains in the background, the mountains are not in focus. But yet we all look at them and go, man, that's amazing. That's a beautiful photo. But our mind makes us believe those mountains are in focus. It doesn't bother us. It kind of, it's like a trick. We can trick ourselves into thinking that the mountains in the back of this frame, the hills are in focus. They're not, um, you know, so with this, you can't see, <laughs> I can't, I, I can point with my finger, um, but you see the paintbrush uh, down the red ones down closer in the foreground. Um, if I were shooting this photo again, excuse me. For so the red, uh, the, the paintbrush down here towards the bottom of the frame, um, I would shoot this frame and, and uh, if, you know, shooting this frame, knowing that I'm fairly close to the subject, I would probably shoot this at either F11 or F16. 
Now, I know that my lens is not as sharp at F16 as it is at F11, or even at F8 would be even better, but I'm trading some of that sharpness for more in focus, right? So I would focus on the paintbrush, the, the ones that are the farthest away from the camera, knowing I get a little bit of depth of field in front and a lot more behind, one third in front, two thirds behind. Um, and so with doing that, I would pick a point just either my subject, the, you know, the flowers that I want the most to be in focus or just a little bit behind that, knowing I'd get a little bit in front. And then I would check it, zoom in and check. Um, so with this, yeah, uh, if I'm two feet away from the flowers, I'm gonna be shooting at F16. If I'm like five or six feet away, I might be shooting at F11. And, you know, there's a little bit of just, I don't know what you call it, like, like just experience that comes with like knowing like how much you need and when and how close, you know, the more you tilt your camera is going to affect it. There's a lot more we could go into this. Um, so like with this, I could shoot this at F8. Probably I could shoot this at 5.6, maybe even 2.8 um, because the trees, this is uh, with the Olympus uh, just, you know, in Colorado just a little while ago. Um, the trees are distant enough. I'm not like, three feet from the flower, two feet from the flower. The trees are like a hundred feet away or maybe 200 feet away. So with this on a full frame camera, I would shoot this at F8, right? Because I know that for all intents and purposes, everything is at infinity, the mountains, the trees, the mid ground, all of that. And that's where my lens is the sharpest. And so that's, that's the difference between focus and, or being in focus and sharpness. On the Olympus, I shot this at five, six because it's like, in a sense, like a stop difference because it's a smaller sensor, but are there questions about this? Cause this is, I think one of the more technical complicated things of uh, landscape photography. Um, which Olympus did you go with? Uh, I've got the OM1. So they're new, well, I don't know how new it is, six months or something like that, um, yeah the OM-1. So technically it's not an Olympus, it's a OM systems, OM, whatever it is. Sys, I can't remember what the, they changed the name of the company. So it's a little uh, confusing. I, I bought one a year ago, not the same one, but yeah, I carried the heavy, heavy gear and I lugged it all over Iceland. I, I will never do that. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of, yeah, we were talking like yes. going on a yeah. trip and so, it's so light. <laughs> Go you, ahead. You gave a rule of thumb and I, it, I, and it, you were talking about how many feet you, a general rule, how many feet and you use F16 or F11. Could you say that again? For sure. Yeah. So I, I generally think about a scene like this where everything is distant, I'm shooting whatever the lens is gonna be the sharpest at. So on the Olympus, it's probably more like five, six. Um, on a full frame, it's probably more like five, eight from, or sorry, uh, F8. Um, yeah. uh, you know, so then it becomes, if I'm shooting like in a field of flowers and I'm standing five or six feet away, I, I'm talking full frame numbers. So convert them down one stop. You know, I would probably be shooting at F11. And if I'm, you know, fairly close, three, four feet, I might be shooting at F16. Um, okay. Basically, once they get to be like real big frame filling flowers, you need a lot of depth of field. But when they're distant, you know, like these trees, it doesn't really matter because it's all infinity. Yeah. Okay. And you can, you can get things like a app on your phone that helps you calculate out. But again, who wants to get the tape measure? And But it, it is maybe worth spending a couple minutes with it and just seeing like, hey, at, at F8, at, you know, and it changes by focal length too. So it's like one other piece of that. But at F8 at 24 millimeters, how much depth of field do I get? Oh, it's 20 feet? Okay, well now I have a sense of like how much range I have. Because you just have to think it's like a slice of the depth between these trees or from myself to the trees all the way to the mountains. How much of that is in focus? Um, and there's, there's also the trick now, um, you know, you also have focus peaking, right. Where it'll like outline it in red and there's a, um, I, uh, it's a great tool. If you want to know more about that, there's a, on my website, 
I wrote an article for Outdoor Photographer and it should be on there. Um, and you can download it for free. Don't tell them that, but um, no, they know. But uh, um, yeah, and it talks all about like that, that uh, focus peaking and kind of what that is and why and how it works and stuff. It's pretty slick to tell what will or will, won't be and where is infinity and things like that. So okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of already talked about this sharpness, in focus, perceived focus. Um, the only other thing is, I know when I started in photography and probably many of us in landscape were like, oh, I want everything to be in focus. We shot everything at F22. And, and then, you know, now I'm like, I go back to some of these like old slides and I'm like, man, too bad that thing's not a little sharper because your lens is probably the worst <laughs> at F22 or wide open, hmm. um, especially those older lenses. So in general, I don't think, except for doing sun stars, like I don't ever shoot at F22. Um, you know, very, I mean, very, very rarely, because I think it would be different depending on what you shoot. But, you know, for the subjects that I shoot, I tend to not need, you know, an inch to infinity in focus, something like that. And I just know it's just not going to be that sharp. So, so I got a couple of examples here as we're talking about depth of field, and, you know, what aperture would you shoot this at? Well, realistically, with this, there's nothing super close to the camera. Um, I would shoot this at f8 or on a crop sensor camera, you know, maybe 5.6, f8, 5.6, something like that. It's not going to make any difference because everything is distant at infinity. But at the same time, if I wanted, you know, the water's moving, so I knew it wouldn't be super sharp down here in the foreground anyways. But if those were flowers and they were like crisp and there was no wind, I'd probably want more depth of field. But I was going for, you know, I want to be able to blow this up as big as possible. So I want as sharp as I can out of the lens. Here's another test question. Uh, so this is uh, in the Sierras. The last one was in the Sierras also, actually. Um, I don't know if you've ever, if you recognize it, but there's an old, old photo of Ansel Adams that had uh, snow um, in part of this scene, but it's in Lake, uh, Precipice Lake. Um, and it's like a two day hard two day backpack to get to this lake. So not a lot of people shoot it. But so with this, if if I wasn't trying to include the background or the foreground, I should say, I would just focus on the mountain and I would shoot it at F8 because that would be my sharpest or five six. Assuming, you know, I have enough light and there's no other issues. Good night. You can say good night to my kids. <laughs> yeah. We're at the Doozy Basin. That's Isosceles Peak. That is, uh, no, it's not Doozy Basin. It's, uh, 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 it is called Picture Peak. Um, and it's, oh, the, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Boy, it sure looks like Isosceles Peak. Yeah. No, I know exactly what you're talking about because I've shot both of them. It's, they're very similar. This yeah. is a uh, Sailor Lake so, so, uh, up uh, above uh, Lake Sabrina. So, but with, with this, yeah, I'm again, I'm going to shoot, I actually would focus on the rock, the bottom left corner that's poking out of the water. I'd probably focus about there. And then I would give this probably like F11, something like that. And then I would look and, you know, and, and really I would bracket, you know, make adjustments accordingly. Um, same with this. Again, you know, I'm like right up close to the foreground, you know, the tripod's a little bit high, but, you know, three feet away or something. I would be shooting this at F11 or potentially even F16, depending on, you know, how close I am to the flowers, things like that. Um, and this is an HDR uh, bracketed three frames because, you know, the clouds were so much brighter than the, the, uh, um, the grass down in the foreground. So Tuolumne Meadows. We can do, at some point I, I want to do a book on the Sierras because for people who are into landscape photography in the Sierras, like I would love to just like have an evening of like, you know, let's all show each other photos and try to figure out like, okay, where is that? Oh yeah. Cause I really love landscape photography in the Sierras and I totally geek out on like finding locations and sharing locations and stuff. It's really fun. Um, so, uh, so a little bit of uh, technical stuff, uh, tripods, like when do we need them? Why do we need them? Um, and the real question, I think, I, I definitely believe that the day is coming where we won't need them. Um, you know, I think for like low, slow exposures for moving water, that's probably the thing that'll take the longest. But, you know, the day is coming when we won't have to bracket 
three photos for an HDR in order to get the highlights and shadows in very high contrast situations. Like the D850 Canon similar or, you know, the Z9, um, you know, those cameras have so much dynamic range that less and less do I actually need that bracketed situation. On um, the Olympus more, I do need that. Um, so, but, you know, it gives you the ability to shoot slow shutter speeds for a greater depth of field you might not be able to shoot at f11 or f16 because it's too dark to handhold um you know or slow moving water um you know holding it stable for that and then uh, another trick is uh using your cable release so uh this is uh just this last fall in zion and this is called the subway um i don't know if anybody has ever seen pictures or knows the area or have hiked down in there it's a pretty solid it's like eight or nine mile round trip walking in the water up uh, over boulders and stuff, way, way more challenging than going up the narrows um, to get to this spot. But uh, um, so with this, I'm shooting a slow exposure on the tripod. That way I'm getting the water moving, like flowing through. So, you know, a couple of seconds kind of thing. And I was also wanting the leaves that are floating around in the little water, the pool down there to move and things like that. So anytime you're doing those slow exposures, you either need to set the timer on the camera so you could push the button and then take your hands off the camera and let the vibration stop or you use a cable release, you know, like a thumb button or a trigger or a remote with your phone or whatever, whatever the option. But you really want to be conscious of not moving the camera to start the exposure. Um, and I've, it's going to depend on the focal length. The longer the lens, the more vibration. Um, but at one point I did for a magazine article, I did a bunch of testing and I found, and this is back with a mirror. So mirrorless, there's less vibration. But I found that like anything below, I don't remember what it was, 250th or 125th of a second. Like I could tell, you know, the slower it was, the more consistent it was. But, you know, at, at 125th, it was like, you know, one out of four photos would be soft by me pushing the button. Um, so use the self timer, set it for two seconds, push the button, take your hands off. You know, it's, it slows it down a little bit, but you'll have a much sharper image. So graduated neutral density filters. Uh, this used to be the go-to, you know, Galen Rowles, the guy who kind of came up with this idea, or at least partially came up with the idea. Um, you know, and the idea was instead of a neutral density filter that screwed in, it just made it, the whole thing darker to slow the exposure down um, or to cut the light. Let's make a rectangular one that's dark on top and clear on the bottom, and then we can, you know, blend the dark, the brighter sky with the darker foreground. Um, and for years and years, this was the best thing we could do. And you, most of the time, you couldn't tell, but sometimes you'd tell, like, why is there like a darker line across, or why is it, you know, it's just hard to get a perfect blend. Um, and over time, I started bracketing for HDR and doing this, and then. As, as the HDR stuff got better and I got better at it, honestly, you know, um, I started using the, the graduated neutral density filters less and less because you could do a better job of getting a single exposure to control all the, uh, the tonal ranges by bracketing than by using these filters. Um, so I don't even carry them anymore. If anyone would like to buy a set, <laughs> I have two sets, a backup set that is never going to be used again. And they're just collecting dust. And they're, they were like a hundred bucks a filter. They weren't cheap. So, um, so yeah, so this one, uh, I sent this in as part of an article to Shutterbug when I used to do a lot of writing for them. And um, they actually put it on the cover, which kind of made me laugh because it's not a great photo, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> they covered it up with a lot of stuff. That's for sure. Um, but um, this is uh, Carson City. Uh, actually, or Carson Valley, in, uh, you know, just down from Tahoe. There's a lot of cool stuff up there. So one of the other things, you know, we kind of move away from some of the technical and talk again more about the actual art part of it. And finding shots and, you know, and really taking advantage of them is understanding weather and knowing that bad weather makes great photos, <laughs> makes great light. So getting better with your, uh, you know, the National Weather Service app on your phone, um, that's what I use a lot. There's probably better things, um, but uh, this is Tahoe, by the way. Um, the uh, Down at the bottom on that National Weather Service thing, there's actually a graph and you can click on it and it shows you the estimated percent sky coverage, precip amount, all these things, and, and it graphs it hour by hour. So you can kind of tell like, oh, it looks like there's going to be a break at 
sunrise or at sunset or it looks like so i use that a lot to kind of predict to try to you know is it worth driving is it worth getting up that kind of stuff this is glacier national park these next two photos are pretty straight <laughs> like i didn't do a lot of editing to them and they're the same morning within about a half an hour of and and it was crazy because this was this crazy stormy sunrise um and then this happened wow double rainbow and it was like all the other photographers packed up because that's st crazy stormy sunrise it started raining and i was like well i'll just hang out you know just put my camera in the bag and put my rain jacket on and hung out and uh you know people that had way fancy expensive cameras like they would be fine in the water um they all left and then you know the storm broke so for half an hour there was nothing going on except for rain but then the storm broke and we got these rainbows and i went down to the water and shot it um so yeah so being out there and spending the time we were talking about shooting in bad weather you know and then we've been talking about that olympus thing um you know i shot that camera in snow like pouring rain and it got pooped on by an eagle this last week like a big i got just yeah it was i got a lot we'll just say like two cups a cup and a half of of just on my head and all over the camera and oh. uh you know and the the staying outside when it's raining is when you get the shots like this and recognizing that your camera can take a lot more abuse it doesn't have to be that olympus but your camera can take a lot more abuse than what we think so like we went and walked at a spot for oh an hour and a half each way one day and it was pretty rainy and uh we all just carried our cameras out and no big deal and when we got back to the car we dried them off with a hotel towel and everybody's camera was fine so you know shooting in bad weather it was raining when i shot this in costa rica this is during one of my costa rica workshops um and we're shooting hummingbirds at this uh restaurant under the roof the hummingbirds come into the feeders and we're photographing so you can shoot in the rain but there's this waterfall there um, and yeah shooting in the rain obviously if you were to look at this the waterfall is not super sharp the the uh, plants in the background and things, they're not super sharp because there's a lot of moisture but the stuff in the foreground is sharp which makes our mind think the rest of it is sharp so it's that perceived sharpness yeah. shooting in bad weather right it's not necessarily a landscape but staying out and shooting when it's raining you know we have i i have lots of photos of toucans but you know we've all seen photos of toucans but how many of them are you know spraying water off themselves that's cute can you see what the shutter speed this was? Yeah. So, so this was uh. So normally I'm an icon guy. So this is, oh man. Uh, I think it was probably a somewhere between five hundredth and a thousandth of a second, somewhere in there. I don't remember. I'd have to look. Um, I do remember this was we were testing out the Z9, and it's twelve thousand eight hundred ISO, um, and it was shot as a JPEG accidentally. Wow. <laughs> so. Um, and I was blown away. I was like, that looks really pretty darn good. You know, I don't know that I, I have not blown it up like 20 by 30 or something, but um, I was blown away. I was like, I think the world has changed. I didn't even do any topaz or any of that stuff to it either. That was just straight out of the camera. Um, the world has changed as to what's possible, I think. So yeah, don't put the camera away when, the, when it gets nasty. If you're, if you're traveling, borrow the hotel towel. Um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, use it, um, cover it up, but you know, they can take a lot of abuse. So I do a lot of shooting, uh, of rafting for uh, a rafting company called oars. Um, and so I shot some grand Canyon trips and some other things. Um, that's what this is from, but really it's, I really like putting, you know, um, like most of my wildlife or adventure photos are really their landscape photo for the most part. Um, with some kind of element of the rafter, the bears, you know, things like that. I have the tight shots, you know, of the bears or the mountain biker or the runner, or whatever. But the ones that I like the most personally are the ones where it's a small subject in a big landscape, because this landscape by itself, it's, it's okay. It's nice. It's nothing cool, amazing, but we put a subject in there. All of a sudden we've given those bears a place that they live. We've told the story of, you know, what it's like to be down in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Without the boat, we would have no sense of how big this is. With the boat, we're like, oh man, it's a, it's a deep canyon. 
you know, so between these two, you know, which one, they both tell different stories. Which one gives more of a story of place? I think it's definitely this one mm -hmm. as a landscape. And uh, this again, like we're, I've, I've been really experimenting a lot with what's possible. This is a handheld bracketed photo because that background was pretty bright and these guys were in a pretty, sh you know, fairly darker area. And so I basically blended the exposure of the two areas because the camera couldn't do it um, back to basically what we could see with our eye. This is just a straight photo um, at a hundred millimeters because that's as wide as the lens would go. It's uncropped. <laughs> that's as wide as the lens would go. Um, so, and I, with this, I was like set up on the river bar, bears were fishing. And then this uh, sow and cubs like walked down the river from like half a mile away. So she knew I was there. And when they got this close, I was kind of like, <laughs> I was by myself and I was looking over my shoulder. I'm like, if I move, am I going to spook her? Do I back? It was kind of one of those, I think I'm better to just not move, not say anything. I had the camera sitting on my leg. I was sitting cross-legged. So I was looking down into the, like the fold out screen to get that low perspective. And I just kept shooting and watching her and going and thinking, there's no way I can get away. There's no way, get, like the ball is completely in her court. I'm just going to be as le least aggressive as passive as I possibly could um, to not offend. And, you know, she kind of shooed the cubs along and, and it was fine. So another landscape with a subject, uh, Glacier National Park, right? Small subject. This kills me because this is like a very early digital and it just doesn't have the dynamic range and, the, you know, it doesn't look as good as a modern camera would. Um, I need to re rework it. It might be better now with better software, but um again setting up i i found the the background this is the sutter buttes in kind of sacramento valley uh, north of sacramento um i found this location you know with a good view of the buttes it was a sun you know nice sunset i could not for the life of me find a way to not have that horizontal bank across in the middle i wish it wasn't there and i've debated taking it out with photoshop it wouldn't be hard um i personally don't think that I, you know, I, I coming from the journalism background, that's beyond my ethics of what I'm willing to do. It'd be a better photo without it. But, um, but basically I just hung out here waiting until something happened. Cause I was like, this is a great scene. If I get some swans to swim through, you know, they weren't around at the time, but I just thought at some point birds are going to fly across or something cool will happen. And then I'll shoot it. Um, kind of like that Eagle and the, the mountains. Mm. Right. So Again, it's not necessarily like a, a landscape, like a traditional, you know, mountains and, you know, fields and flowers, things like that. But I still think of this as a landscape in terms of putting the bird in a, in a scene as opposed to what, and I should say, I'm not like putting him there. He's flying. I'm photographing him. I didn't cut him out or paste him into another photo, but having the bird shooting it wide in a scene or these shooting it wide in a scene gives a sense of place right? This is the uh, first time I ever went to Alaska to photograph eagles. And, um, you know, I laid down on the frozen river and like got this low angle. And really, it was like shooting them through the snow, the background, the interaction between the subjects. You know, it's a wildlife photo, yes. But the, if you think about it, those birds are, uh, I don't know, what, 10%, 5% of the actual frame. Um, but, you know, this is probably one of my favorite wildlife photos that I've taken because it really has this this feel of shooting through that wet snow and, and it just looks cold and and you know uh, it looks wintry <laughs> you know it looks like Alaska so um, another wildlife you know again putting a wildlife uh, this is Costa Rica in a scene building a landscape around it um, so we kind of dig into questions here a bit more because, yeah, I was going to say this is my last like main slide and really do questions. I got like a wrap up slide, but, you know, I think a lot of times we have a lot of questions about, you know, equipment. I think, you know, the camera equipment, especially this last generation, is just like mind blowing what is possible with it. And it's really kind of almost doesn't matter what system you're using. You know, the lenses are so good if you if you have, you know, pretty modern lenses, um, you know, we've talked about, you know, for what, for 
landscape photography, traditional, not so much the wildlife in the landscape type things. I'm tending to, with my Nikon stuff, I'm tending to use the uh, 14 to 24, 2.8. I have the 24 to 120, and I have a 100 to 400. So, you know, I'm covered basically from 14 all the way to 400. Um, you know, for landscape stuff, I'm tending to be probably most commonly shooting in the 18 to 20-ish millimeters, you know, if I had to pick a number, um, you know, but it, I think that's very dependent on what subjects you like to shoot. You know, I like to shoot the vertical. I like to get up close with the flowers, you know, so for a lot of those, the wider, the better, right? Because it makes it look like this huge, big field of flowers, which is all a trick, right? <laughs> you know, photography is all about uh, including some things and excluding other things. You know, the power pole that's right next to you when you're shooting, you know, I did this cover for a, a local tourism magazine and it's like this big old field of poppies that looks all gorgeous. Well, there's a power pole and a dumpster on the other side, you know, but you can't tell because I'm super wide and I'm super close down on it. It looks like this field of poppies goes for miles. It's this tiny little patch. So it's all about what are you including? What are you excluding? I'm not removing those things. I'm not moving the dumpster or Photoshopping it out, but I'm choosing... The camera, this is what I like about photography stills rather than video, um, is in a single frame, you're telling the entire story and what you choose to exclude or include, you're cutting out and creating a, a scene where versus a video, it's like, you can tell a different kind of story, but it's not a single image. So, um, so yeah, we could talk to no end about all these things. Um, Cause yeah, I've been going about an hour um, so to wrap up, and then I'll just, we'll just chat, talk questions and things. Um, to wrap up, uh, uh, I was like, I love this photo. Um, while styles have changed, you know, we've kind of been talking about this. Photography has never been easier. So this is uh, this guy, Ed Cooper. He was a climber in Yosemite um, and then became a landscape photographer, you know, back in the cameras like that days. Um, and I uh, did a lot of Sierra clubs and things like that. Um, you know, the wall calendars. Um, he's in his late 80s now i think he's still alive um i saw this photo of him and i sent him an email and i was like ed can i please use this in a, in, <laughs> to talk about like how much easier it is uh you know to take this is in the white mountains so shooting across towards the sierras you know now it's like you could probably take a an image that's probably of similar quality maybe even with your phone if not with like almost any camera that any of us would have um, you know it's amazing and plus you know he's got some good style points with the pants so yeah <laughs> so yeah so i mean i think the key with really being successful in landscape photography or any photography is being out there on a regular basis practicing right whether it's shooting or editing or you know playing with your camera i don't know but like the more often you do it the more it becomes muscle memory versus you know you go out on one trip to Yosemite every winter and then your camera doesn't come out for three months you have to remember where the buttons are you have to find everything again you where did I put my filters you know all of that sort of stuff so you know the more often you do it the easier it gets um if you you know whether it's me or anyone else I think a great learning thing is going with someone you know a mentor whether that's going on a photo workshop with someone like myself or you know, going out with a friend, you know, any of those things, mentoring, and then doing the same thing for others, right? I've done a lot of mentoring of uh, like high school kids, taught a bunch of high school courses in photo. And, uh, you know, it's fun to like pass on the knowledge and give away your old cameras that aren't worth a lot anyways, give them to some high school kid because they love them. And it's like amazing when they get something like that. So, so we're going on this big trip this next year. Uh, the next photo workshop that I have scheduled is a Costa Rica trip in February of 2024. So that's the next official work I have, aside from a bunch of magazine, like writing columns and things like that. And then I'm going to hopefully do Yosemite, Tahoe. We're going to go to Patagonia and scout out Patagonia, hopefully this year on our trip. Um, and then I've got a bear trip. Uh, I've got a boat chartered to go out to Katmai, uh, which is where those bear photos are from in August. Um, which is, if you're interested in bears, we could talk bears all day. Um, I can show you a YouTube video I made of it, but um, bear bear photography is really expensive. <laughs> you know, it's the most expensive trips. Um, but 
aside from the photography, the experience of being that close to grizzly bears, brown bears that are habituated to people and well-fed on salmon that basically you just set up in a spot, you stay out of their way and you just let them come walk by. They fish for salmon, like, you know, a hundred feet away from you. They run right past you and they're fishing for salmon. I mean, it's like such a cool wildlife experience, like let alone the photos. I'm, I'm definitely hooked on it. So, and then I do the, uh, the Eagle workshops in November in Alaska as well. So, but, but what questions do people have? Let's, are I've you got a couple of, yeah, yeah. Well, I have a couple of questions on uh, on a couple of your images. Uh, first of all, one with Zion, you used a fourteen twenty four lens, and you used a polarizer on it. Now, if you use a Norcor, the the Nikkor, it has a bubble on the front of it. Do you use a a, a a polarizer that you just hold in front of it, or do you have something special for it? The new one is flat. Oh, okay. The new one has filter threads. The uh, the one for the the Z like the mirrorless system, okay. Because um, I had that other one, yeah, yeah, and that was one of the things that sold me on it. I was like, it's half the size of the the DSLR version, and it has filter threads, so you can theoretically thread on a filter. I mean, it's a stupidly big filter, but you can you can okay. thread on a filter. Okay, but, I have the old one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is an amazing lens, but yeah, you got some. Yeah, and and you probably are aware of this. Like once you get super wide, the polarizer starts to create its own issues right? because oh, it doesn't absolutely. polarize equally. Um, I find shooting vertically, I don't notice that much because you're not shooting very much different angle towards the sun. Right. But if you shoot horizontally, you know anything more than twenty four, maybe twenty millimeters, you start to get one side of the sky is polarizing differently, darker than the other. Um, right. I've seen that a lot. Mm -hmm. a, a second question is when you took yeah. the picture of horsetail mm -hmm. uh, when you were snowshoeing up a glacier point road did you mm -hmm. go off the road or did you find a viewpoint mm -hmm. on the road or did you use that's a couple miles it's a couple miles off the road it's okay. like almost a glacier point and then down a couple of miles okay yeah and it, i mean there's other views that are closer to the road as well um like basically out of glacier point you can kind of I'm trying to remember what you can see from there I don't think you can see that angle from Glacier Point. If I, no, I think you're too far away there. Yeah, yeah. I think I, basically by the time you get past Sentinel Dome, I think you kind of start to lose the angle on on El Capitan. If I remember, I was thinking right. Taft Point somewhere in that area. Yeah, yeah. That's basically that. Yeah, it's not at Taft Point, but it's like right along in that below right. Sentinel Dome Taft Point area. Yeah, exactly. Good eye. You get the you win the award. Very rarely <laughs> does anyone know where that was from. I, if you're shooting Nikon and you have an old uh, mirror, not mirrorless rig, they have mm -hmm. a 17 to 35 that's an F2.8 that's also a flat. So that's good compromise sometimes between the 14 to 24 and the 24 to 70. Yeah. Well, and having that flat front, I mean, I found that I just didn't use, I had previously the older version of the 1424 and I found it was very rare that I missed the ability to use a polarizer. It wasn't enough to give up that yeah. extra wide angle. Um, but yeah, the, with the unprotected glass bubble on the front of that, I was always, I never did damage it, but I was always like, oh man, like I'm going to mess this thing up for sure. It weighs a ton too. So Yeah, the new one weighs half of it. It's smaller. It weighs half as much. It's yeah, substantially better lens, it, and it's sharper a little bit. Not like blow it out of water, but it, it is a little bit sharper. And you said you used the, uh, I guess it's a twenty-four to one twenty rather than the twenty-four to seventy. Uh, I use the the, the one twenty because I think it has more range for carrying just a fewer fewer lenses. Is that uh, what your choice is? uh i got the 24 120 and then the 100 to 400 um so yeah that 24 to 120 is a great range like if there's just like one lens that's like best one lens option i think that anybody's making right now um you know so if it's depending on what i'm doing you know i may not even bring like if i have to carry my stuff into the backcountry or something i'm not carrying a 100 to 400 you know it's just too big too heavy um but you know if 
you know, like uh, we were talking about Steve went to Alaska and, uh, you know, he wanted to bring every lens he had, you know, it, it, as long as it's possible, you know, you have a porter or a mule or a car or whatever, like I'm certainly going to bring all of it. Yeah, I, I told the Nat Geo photographers this really isn't fair because when you travel with National Geographic, they 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 let you bring whatever you want and they'll porter it for you, you know. So. Yeah, and they put the bill, right? It makes it totally different. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all compromises, you know, in terms of image quality, weight, reach. You know, that's kind of my, my question with this uh, trip right now. Like, I'm kind of in the, well, I could take everything. If I take the Olympus, I could take everything from 16 millimeters to 400. I take the Nikon, I can take 24 to 120. And they're, you know, not completely comparable in weight, but not that far apart in weight, um, you know, which is why I'm like, man, I would really like something wider than 24 and longer than 120, which is why I'm leaning towards taking that Olympus. So other questions? <laughs> we can talk all day. Yeah. Do you know Christy Odom? Uh, I don't think so, no. Who is she? She um, she does a lot of uh, adventure travel as well. Um, she takes groups to the brown bears in Alaska. That's why I just thought you'd probably know. Yeah, I, I, maybe I've met her and I don't remember. You know, it's not that big of a world. Yeah, so. right, right. Yeah, exactly. So are you going to blog right? about your trip? What's that? Are you going to blog about your trip or just <laughs> that, that's been like the debated thing right now so we started a instagram page called the feral family um <laughs> like feral kids feral dog whatever um uh, so right now we've just posted some photos on there um we we did like buy the domain as well oh. um, so like, we spent like a couple days like dreaming up names and then like looking to see oh somebody already has this somebody already has that um <laughs> So it's getting harder. What's that? It's getting harder to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not dot com. It's dot uh God, I don't remember. Because we haven't actually set up the website. And we've kind of, it's a uh, you know, neither one of us have had time with getting ready to go and everything else. So, but we I think that's the intended idea is to like do a blog of us traveling and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So yeah, you can, and I actually realized I didn't even put my email address on the bottom of this page and all of the things that I wrote. Um, but you can always uh, send me an email if you want me to put you on my email list or, or if any of these particular trips are interesting, like I keep a, a list on a spreadsheet of like, oh, these are the people who are interested in Costa Rica. So I like let them know before I even, like I just put the dates up on the website a few days ago, but there's already several spots that have been sold. Um, to people who had said they wanted to go um, you know so if you're like oh man i really am interested in one of these like send me an email okay. or i can put them on the mailing list and if you're like i really want to see the craziness of you know uh two grown adults and two children traveling with one backpack each for a year and a half or whatever it is um like <laughs> you can i can connect you with that too because <laughs> it, it, it's going to be you know, we're narrowing it down. I'm like, okay, I get two pairs of pants and two pairs of shorts for a year. Well, yeah. I hope it doesn't get cold. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like originally it was going to be more of a tropical trip, but now we're like, we're going to Ecuador. That's the first place we're flying. And we we're looking at like where we're talking about going. And we're like, oh, the average temperature this time of year is somewhere between 60 to 70 degrees at the, at the top. So you know, it's going to be cooler than we thought. And then we want to go up into the Andes and, you know, to Patagonia and stuff. We're like, I think we need to bring more clothes than we planned. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know whether we're going to go to the Galapagos. We've been kind of trying to figure that out because um, we're already going to be in Ecuador. But Galapagos is not a cheap thing on a backpacking budget, you know, when we're trying to go for a long, long time. So we may not. I don't know. Oh, it's going to be a great adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I guess putting you on the spot, 
you covered many, many different topics. And if there's one takeaway, is there something that you would want people to remember most of all? That's a good question. Uh, I think it's probably the most important part is that you're passionate about your subject, your subjects, whatever, you know, um, uh, talking to, it was a dentist, I think. Yeah. That was like, they recognized like, Oh, is that, you know, this spot in Yosemite, it's like, okay, he clearly is passionate about Yosemite <laughs> or the back country or, or those things, you know? So all of a sudden, if that's the subject you're shooting, your photos are going to be better for it, you know? So it's really, you know, I, I think, for a long time, and I cannot get anybody to bite on this. For a long time, I've been pitching different publishers, like, like a series of articles about the idea of uh, mentorship and the idea of having a mentor. And then the idea of first you emulate that mentor and then you outgrow them or you take up golf and you give up photography because you get bored. Right? In the beginning, you you find someone that you're like, man, I love what they're doing. And then you kind of do the same thing, um, but then you outgrow it because eventually you can't just keep copying them. You have to figure out your own thing and it's whatever it is that you're interested in. So you don't have to worry about like what you saw, like that I'm interested in, you know, that's not necessarily good or bad landscape photography. It's what do you like to photograph? If it's like, you notice there's really no beach photos in there. I don't really go to the beach. I'm not really a beach guy. I'm a mountain person, you know? And yeah. so, you know, you guys live close to the beach compared to me. You know, if that's your thing, you know, it's photographing something that you can photograph on a regular basis that you enjoy and you're excited about and that you want to go there, whether you're taking a picture or not. Like if you want to go hang out for three hours at a place, whether you have your camera or not, then that's the place you should be shooting. So, yeah, that's probably being passionate about your subjects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just, it's it's kind of like when I used to play golf. You know, I, I was never a good golfer, but it was just great to be outside and <laughs> just to yeah. do those things. And in the end, when you're out photographing in nature, you know, it's it's the environment you're in. Whether you get a good day photographing or not, it's great to be outside. And mm -hmm. be those yeah, places. Be, being on the computer or in an office, right? Um, for sure. And I think, you know, once you turn it into a job, that's obviously a bit of the struggle is that you're like, you know, you feel like, okay, I took the day to go to the wildlife refuge. I, you know, it needs to pay off with, you know, a couple of good photos from the day. And, you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, you know, so it does, you know, sometimes make it a little bit harder to enjoy or to, you know, puts a little more undue pressure on it. Mm -hmm. So other questions, we didn't really get into a lot with like filters and neutral density filters and things like that. <laughs> but you know, um, as far as, you know, for water flaw, waterfalls. Um, that's another thing some cameras have built in now, so. <laughs> I know, yeah, I, I I I don't have a photo in here, but I was playing with that this uh, October. And yeah, I'm, I'm like, oh, I think I'm just gonna take a single neutral density filter on this entire trip, you know, because if I want 10 stops, but otherwise I think I can just do it with the camera. Yeah. Have you worked at all with, uh, you know, you talked about graduated neutral density and all that, and where well, you can do bracketing now, but also the other thing that you can do, which I found extremely useful when uh, I came back from Alaska was the capability to do filtering within Lightroom now with the sky and other objects where you can effectively select the sky and tone it down so that it doesn't blow out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think just amazing. Yeah. What they've added in Lightroom in the last, well, there's been like two updates in the last, what, like six months or so. There was one just recently um, with the ability to basically click like select the sky. And if you don't do too much, you know, if you like crank it a long ways one way or the other, you do start to see like weird edges between the sky and the mountains if we're talking landscapes and stuff. But if you're talking half a stop to maybe, maybe almost as much as a stop, like, it's seamless and it's quick. Um, you know, the only difference is, you know, if you bracket that photo for HDR, all of a sudden, instead of having, you know, and it's going to depend on the camera and the mm -hmm. sensor, you know, having maybe a stop before you notice it. Now, maybe you have two stops before you have issues. Um, but yeah, the ability, I mean, I'm finding, you know, like if this photo that's in the background here, you know, 
if I were to have this in Lightroom now, I would just click sky and I would add some dehaze and I would darken it a little bit. Um, and that would make the mountains come out a little more. And, you know, within 30 seconds, you can already, you know, make the image pop a lot more. Um, I'm trying to think what in this slideshow would be an example of that. That would be, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I've done that recently with. <laughs> um, well, this one here, right? So with this, I don't have it. Uh, I'm just trying to think if I have it uh, on the computer, the actual file I can show you. But um, yeah, I, I used the graduated filter in Lightroom and brought it up from the bottom to kind of like tone down the foreground. And then I uh, selected the cloud, the sky and, you know, brought the sky down just a little bit. And then um, uh, the, I'm pointing again, the, uh, the, the mountains that are lit up, I actually toned down the highlights a little bit to try to retain some detail in there. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, this was like a two minute edit or something like that. Um, whereas before you'd have to like cut things out, um, you know, all of that. Say, this is maybe even a better example of that where, you know, if I were to work this now, it didn't have, like you could select those things before, but it was like by color range and it just, it worked okay, but it wasn't great. If I were to do this now, and, you know, I was starting from scratch on this, I would select the sky, bring it down to try to match what, more with the mountains. Um, you can select the background, which would be everything but the sky. Um, and then you can balance those two. Um, and then, you know, the tricky part is, how do you, the water, this is the, the hard part with reflections, right? Well, the reflection needs to match the sky. So if you darken the sky, but the reflection is still bright, brighter than the sky, that doesn't make sense, you know, visually. So you got to tone the, the reflection down as well. Um, you know, and if you look at this image, the reflection, the way it should be, right, is just a little darker than the sky in the mountains, um, you know, but, you know, like I said, this was, three exposures because one exposure, I was either going to lose the detail on the foreground or I was going to lose the detail in the snow in the mountains. But it was just too wide of a range on that. The Where is our histogram? Where was it? Here we go. It would be as if the histogram went off the edges of that graph. And so the only way I could do it was by, you know, shooting a brighter and a darker and then putting them together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I want to thank you for spending the evening with us. Yeah. I appreciate it.